Hello, 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 my dear friends. Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, maybe good night, wherever you are listening from. This is Raj Kapoor. And today, my dear young titans, this is our last show for 2020. And then 2021 is going to bring so much more. But we have a treat for you today. And I'm telling you, this is going to be an amazing, amazing session. You know why? Because I know our main speaker today so well. Personally, he's just going to be fabulous. But before we introduce, let me just tell you about the Young Titans platform. Now, if you are a returning listener or a viewer, welcome. And if you are brand new, again, a great, wonderful welcome. So Young Titans platform is where young professionals and entrepreneurs join after their college graduation or when they are in the workforce to propel their career, get inspired and become a part of a thriving community. Listen, if you're not a part of it, you're missing out. Now, please share this live or a recording with your friends, family, and others. Like our page, subscribe our channel, send us live questions on the Facebook, uh, comments, and, uh, and you can always email us at info at unextleadership.com. See, Young Titans platform, YTP in short, fills the gap from what you know and what you need to know to succeed. In short, we are filling the gap between you and the leadership as young professionals embarking in the workforce. See, there are colleges, schools, there are departments to start your career. On the other hand, what happens is that they have leadership training, technical training. That is what is in the corporation and the workforce. But what is it out there for you to excel? From my perspective, there is basically not much, not much. See, this is what we try to fill. See, I've seen many people who get at this juncture indecisive as to what the career path should be, where they should go. And in this platform, we are bringing in speakers, panelists every single week with different backgrounds. Now, these are the people who are talking to you from their real life experiences. You don't see, understand, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Understand from the achievements or the failures that others have had in their life. And that can really help you young generation achievers to get to the stage that you need to reach and can give you some great ideas which you might not have ever thought of. And this is why we have created this free platform for you. And it has been helping a lot of young professionals because you know what? You give us so beautiful feedback that we get that we know that these things are making a difference in your life. And please keep on giving us the feedback because that helps us bring to you more speakers who really can talk to you, talk into you. Now, I'm Raj Kapoor. And let me give a quick introduction about myself and few of our hosts before we bring on our today's special speaker. So I'm Raj Kapoor. I'm the founder and CEO of Options Ahead. For over 30 years, I've worked as a chief financial officer, have had uh, been an entrepreneur with many businesses on the side. Now I'm teaching wealth and mindset principles, including running online program called Guidance to Wealth. I do mentoring, coaching, executive and wealth mindset coaching. See, what I do is I help individuals live their dream life by resolving their financial stress without needing to make more money. My passion resides in making a difference in others' lives, especially in people who are starting their business or career. People like you. People like you. Now, let me introduce some folks. My great, my good friend, my buddy, Sheikh Rahman. Sheikh Rahman is the orchestrator of the YTP platform. It is his brainchild. Sheikh is an engineer by background. He's the founder of Unext Leadership for Training. 
He emphasizes the values one needs to have. He liked to work with people. And he was slowly drawn to people who value people. That is where his leadership journey started. He wanted to learn how do they do that. His inspiration are few people that include some people in this community and also his family, starting from his grandmother, his daughter, his sister, and his wife, from whom he learned a lot of leadership basics. He likes to hang out with like-minded people, and he likes to share or teach what he knows. One reason behind that he knows is that teachers learn the most. And he's going to be the host along with few of other co-hosts. But I will tell you, Sheikh, you have done a wonderful job by bringing this platform for the Young Titans. I, I'm telling you, you don't even know yourself the difference that you are making in others' lives. Wonderful job. Let me now introduce to you good friend Ron Cooper. There is my friend Ron. Ron and Marty are retired Air Force and CIA officers. Now they're in their 52nd year of marriage and relation, and they are relationship coaches. Actually, I have taken Ron's course on relationship. And believe me, young titans, if you haven't, and if you don't know about it, you're missing out. Go and check out his profile. Take a look at his courses. He is amazing with his wife, Marty. Uh, Ron helps organizations develop high-performing teams through human behavior insights, personal coaching, and leadership training. Both Ron and Marty serve through their Cooper Culture organization. Let me now introduce Glenn Hodges. Hello, my dear friend, Glenn. Just wonderful to see you. Glenn is a lifelong student of personal development, a results coach and motivational speaker, teacher dedicated to helping people just like you to achieve goals. Many would call impossible. Experience has taught him the key to living an abundant and rewarding life, and that is to dream big, think big, and to take massive action while drawing on your inner strength. The lion within. Glenn pushes his clients to shoot for the moon because if they miss, they will still land among the stars. And I'm telling you, they do. He's that good. He's the founder, uh, self-improvement, uh, meet up a free virtual mind uh, mind mass mastermind group, and and he has a wonderful mastermind group. By the way, I have been a part of it. Glenn is also and a member of the John Maxwell team. Serves on the boards of several nonprofit organizations. Uh, he earned his bachelor's in journalism from University of Georgia, after which he climbed the corporate ladder of a Fortune 50 electric company for 14 years the first company he founded with no prior experience after resigning from his one and only employer. And it was an international executive search firm, his first client, who was his first employer. Welcome, Glenn. Now let me introduce to you, Dr. Halida. Hello, hello, Dr. Halida. It's so wonderful to see you every single time, and you have been such a valuable part of YTP platform. Your experience, your knowledge is just immense. He's currently a faculty of International Health Department at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her achievement and awards, as I said before, two every single time are just too long. But Dr. Halida has demonstrated her leadership role by founding a reproductive health research institute she helped develop reproductive health research capacity through conducting scientific research in Bangladesh. She has over 40 journal publications and served on many committees of WHO, Geneva, International Medical Advisory Panel of IPPF, London, on alternate business model of Packard Foundation, and more. You know, I can keep on going. Her achievements and rewards will be very long, as I said. But I do want to mention one thing. She is the United Nations 2006 Population Award winner. Now she's our advisor and inspiring faculty and mentor for Young Titans platform. Thank you, Dr. Alida. Thank you, Raj. Thank you. Now, I would like to mention a couple of people, a couple of great friends who are not able to join us today, but next year they will be a part of it. And they have been a great part of it. And they have been the main speakers. First is Ryan Roberts, who is really a great friend, a great guy. 
who has been making a difference in others' lives for 30 years. And next is Arthi Moore. She is the has 20 plus years of experience and specializes in leadership-based training programs. So you will soon be hearing from them. But now is the time for the drum roll. Now is the time to introduce the main speaker, my dear friend, Jay Johnson. Welcome, Jay. Welcome. It's a pleasure, pleasure to see you here. Hey, Raj. Good to see you, sir. All of you. Absolutely. And thank you. Thank you for coming here. Jay, my good friend, is helping businesses and individuals achieve extraordinary success. And I know it's not an, not an overstatement. Jay is a motivational speaker, trainer, facilitator, consultant, and a coach. He is a retired Air Force veteran who has led teams and organizations all over the world. He led a team of management analysts and was directly responsible for overseeing 32,000 human resource requirements across nine states with an estimate value of $2.8 billion. I'm glad to know him and call him my friend. He is the first one who everyone runs to when they need help. And you know what? He spontaneously comes to ask when a friend has a need. So definitely, you know, he does, didn't have to be here at the YP, YTP platform. He's basically with so much work and everything. But you know what? He is here to make a difference in your lives. He is here because you can learn from him and you can shorten your learning curve. He is, the, he is one who is an open book. And I'm telling you, spend some time with him today. Understand, you're going to enjoy things. He's here from Antonio, Texas. I welcome you, my dear friend, that you're here. Sheikh, would you like to talk and say a few lines about our dear friend, Jay? Um, I don't want to take much uh, time or anything like that from Jay. He is my good friend and for for me, I didn't meet him as a corporate leader, as taking care of billions of dollars or the society or you know community and that, that kind of thing. I met him as a friend when I needed to talk to somebody. I needed. I I met him when I asked somebody to see if they can give me a testimonial, if they can push me on what I'm doing on my purpose, you know, on my trainings and things like that. When we met, we used to meet like almost two times a year or so. And then that's what I met and that's what I got to know him. And I have seen behind the scenes work that he has done for others and, and myself and many others. So I know where his heart is. So I know him as a human being, as a friend, as a giver, but I want to learn from him. I know I'm gonna enjoy it today fully. I expect all of you will be taking notes or learning from him also who are watching it and share it with others. That's the most important thing that you can do because this is all free. And we are getting uh, Jay Johnson from San Antonio, Texas, uh, owner of J2 Leadership. His team and his teamwork, and, uh, uh, those are all immense and they are immensely impacting many others and leaders of course, the Fortune 500 and, and big companies. So let me not wait, but thank you Raj for giving me this opportunity to introduce uh, properly also but my good friend, Jay, Jay Johnson. Shake, thank you, my friend. You are someone that uh, means the world to me. I always enjoy being in the room with you. And now I enjoy being in this time and space with anyone who is watching live or who will watch this recording later. But uh, it is an absolute honor. You are all very kind in the introduction. I usually say uh, I don't warrant such a thing. I really just love to show up and serve, but in the spirit of transparency, because Shake said I'm a, an open book, that's true. I will, I will tell you that getting the schedule coordinated was a little difficult, and I will, I, I'm elated that uh, we were able to make this happen, and, and I guess I'm the last one for the year 2020, and aren't we all looking forward to a better 2021? And uh, so I just thank uh, all of you uh, affiliated with the Young Titans, this leadership team uh, that you just all get to hear from and meet leading into today's session. These are amazing 
uh, men and ladies. And, you know, I, I really admire each and every one of you. So y'all have a great team leading you. And I'm looking forward to serving you in the brief time I have with you this morning. So if you will allow me, I'm going to share my screen. I do have some slides. I often say that one of the best ways to show somebody that you value them is to uh, start by valuing their time. And so I've been given a time window today and I want to make sure that I a start on time and end on time. Uh, but I am going to because all I see on my end right now are my slides. I don't get to see uh, any of our leadership team hosting this. Can I just get a confirmation, Raj, that you can see my slides? Yes, we can see your slides. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I've done this before and <laughs> have gotten, you know, moving, rolling into it, advancing slides, and then, you know, someone finally speaks up and says, hey, we, we don't see anything. So I want to make sure you have these up front. You know, when uh, Sheikh reached out to me and asked me if I would conduct some kind of training for all of you, uh, I'm certainly happy to do this. You know, where I struggle is what do I feel is best going to serve you? And I think what I've teed up for you today is going to resonate with each and every one of you. I think it will be relatable uh, to you. And I will tell you that these two factors that I'm going to speak on today have been instrumental in my own life. And so I'm looking forward to interacting with you all. And I think that this this quote is one that I love to start with because I think the best among us are people who continue to embrace a growth mindset. They're people who are always looking to expand their skill set uh, and develop themselves in some way. And so I love this quote by Zig Ziglar where he said, the only thing worse than training your employees and losing them is to not train them and keep them. And I will tell you that the organizations that I interact with, they understand the value of taking time to pour into their teams. So you all joining in today, participating in this, those of you that are maybe watching this delayed because you couldn't be here live, I celebrate you because you obviously have an appetite for learning and personal growth. And, uh, and I commend and celebrate you for that. So here's what I'm going to talk on with you today. I've been given a 30 minute window, so I'm going to monitor my time and, and step back in at the appropriate time. Once my time is up and then, uh, shake and Raj and, uh, Ron Glenn, Dr. Halita, I assume, you know, if there's questions out there, I'll be happy to take them from anyone. Uh, that has them. But I thought that you would find it beneficial if I spent some time with you today talking about trust and servant leadership. And you heard me earlier say these two factors have meant the world to me. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the author Patrick Lencioni, but I'm a huge fan. He's written many, many books. Uh, and the book that he's probably most well known for is a book called uh, the five dysfunctions of a team. And I'm going to reference a portion of it here in just a minute. But he talks about teamwork remains the ultimate competitive advantage. And he says it's both because it's so powerful and so rare. And I find that to be true. Most organizations that I have the pleasure of serving and going into and conducting training for and coaching their employees, I'm really amazed that uh, that there are so many silos, there's so many people who think that they're more important if they're the only one that knows how to do something. And I love to say to them, that doesn't make you more important, that makes you a liability. You're more important to an organization when you're taking what you know and you're sharing it and teaching it to others. Now you become invaluable to your organization. So teamwork is really important. I, I always love to give a little bit of a roadmap to anyone I'm speaking with. So I'm going to quickly hit a couple rules of engagement and then I'm going to get into talk about the trust factor, servant leadership, and then we'll do a wrap up. I know that many of you watching, you're not able necessarily to step in and, and uh, speak over the lesson that I'm presenting, but I always love to do this just because of what has played out in 2020. We've all done a lot more of this, haven't we? online virtual kinds of lessons and we were joking pre-call about the phrase of the year might be you know you're muted 
<laughs> getting people to unmute their mic. But I actually, when I'm leading a presentation, I love to remind everybody to mute their mic unless they're ready to share something. And then I, I love when people keep their videos on. I know we're on StreamYard today broadcasting this out to a social media page, but sometimes we're on Zoom and in Zoom, uh, people turn their videos off and step away and you can see that. And I just generally think that that is the equivalent of being in the room with a speaker or somebody giving you their time and falling asleep where you're seated. So, you know, if I was in a room with people, and they started to nod off. I get tired. I get it, you know, but I encourage people to stand up, even if it means they have to stand to the side of the room or the back. It's just at least respectful. So I kind of feel the same way when we're online. If videos are shut off and others can see that it's shut off, it makes it feel like you're not participating in it. So that's usually one of my rules of engagement to an audience I'm speaking with. And then I always love for people to bring their perspective and their voice. I want them to participate. And, and I hope that they participate in a transparent way. And you'll see here in a minute why that ties into my very first topic. And then I always love to say to people, look, we don't have to agree in order to respect each other, to value one another. Someone doesn't have to think exactly like we do in order to love them. Right. I genuinely love everyone I meet. I value them as a person and I want them to walk away from that interaction, feeling that as well. So let's not judge the opinion of others. We can have our opinion just as they can have theirs, but we can still be cordial and kind to one another in a loving way. Let's jump into the trust factor. I, I'm really somebody who likes to encourage you to do some reflection, some thinking time, and I love to ask questions. So you're going to get a little bit of that in my time with you today. And I hope you have a pad and, and pen in front of you where you can jot some notes and capture thoughts as we go along, because I really do want to give you things that are going to serve you and be helpful to you beyond just me talking in this time and space with you today. Here's a few reflection questions. Have you ever had your trust violated by somebody? You know, maybe as a close personal friend, maybe it was a loved one. Maybe it was a colleague at work. It could have even been a boss. Whoever it was, I just want you to think about whether or not there was anything you did leading up to it or after it that contributed to it. Because if I was going to be honest with all of you, I would tell you that in virtually every relationship I have and any relationship that I've had in the past where something has gone awry, I was equally responsible for what occurred. And that's not easy to say, and I'm not proud to say that, but I do recognize that I'm a work in progress. I'm human. I make mistakes. But there's a difference, everybody, in my opinion. There's a difference in making a mistake and choosing a course of action. Sometimes we choose to do the wrong thing and that's not a mistake. So there's a little reflection. I just want you to think if, if you've had trust violated in the past, recognize it, but now I want you to think what your part was in that. Uh, you know, for some of us on this call right now or on this video conference uh, right now, we know Chris Robinson and you know, the reason I ask you that last question is because I've heard Chris say this before. He says, you don't have the right to complain about what you permit. And that's what happens sometimes in life. This is why as a coach, when I'm working with others, uh, there's no judgment from me, but I am curious and I continue to ask questions and I, I try to get them to look at their own behaviors and responsibilities in the relationship. Because what happens oftentimes is we look external to us to want to change something when really the only thing we can control and the part that we should spend the most time on is looking internal because there's where we have an opportunity to really make some tremendous gains and growth in our life. So I love that quote by Chris. So I mentioned Patrick Lencioni earlier and I talked about his book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Look, if you've never read it as a young professional, I'm encouraging you. Please go get that book. Even if you get it on audio, get the book. But I encourage you to take copious notes when you listen to it or when you read it. 
Because I think every organization, every team, every relationship has some level of dysfunction. It's there. It happens. And Lencioni talks about the foundation of any effective team begins and ends with trust, which is why I thought bringing you this as a conversation point would be so valuable to you today. See, Lencioni, just real quickly to give you an idea of what his model talks about, he says, if you don't have trust among your team, you'll never be willing to have healthy conflict. And there is healthy conflict. You know what I'm talking about? When you sit around a conference room table and you're interacting with one another, if you feel like you're not in a safe place to bring your opinion and your perspective, what do you do? You withhold it, meaning you're unwilling to bring it forward because you're worried somebody's going to get upset or it's going to get heated. Well, the best teams know that if you really trust each other, anything can be brought to the table and be worked through, have conversation around and dialogue over. And he says, if you can't have healthy conflict, then what you really end up with is a lack of commitment. You're not going to have people really get on board. They're really they're going to sit in a conference room, arms probably crossed, leaning back in their chair, maybe never making eye contact with you. They may head nod when you talk about a decision or when a decision's being made by someone in the room. But then the moment that meeting ends and they walk out into the organization, they start naysaying or bad mouthing or talking poorly about the decision that was made. See, they're not really behind it. They're not committed. See, in, in Lindsay only talks about in, a, in the stage of commitment, what you're really seeking is consensus. And consensus does not mean everybody agrees. Consensus means everybody had an opportunity to bring their voice and perspective to the table. And then once a decision is made, they can commit and get behind it. But you don't get to that point if we didn't first begin with trust. And so if you don't have trust, you don't have that healthy dialogue and conflict where everything gets out on the table into the conversation. And if you don't do that, then people really aren't willing to fully commit behind it. And if you don't really fully commit behind it, then what starts happening is you have people in your team and in your organization avoiding accountability. And I love to say to people, the best type of accountability is not accountability that comes only from the leader at the pinnacle top of the organizational chart. The best accountability is the accountability that comes from peers holding each other accountable. I mean, I've got a dear friend in my life who some on this call, uh, Sheikh and Raj for sure know, Josh Wathan. He lives maybe five miles from me as the crow flies. He's also a John Maxwell team certified coach. But when he and I were at a conference together one time, I got upset. Somebody said something that really frustrated me and I was hanging on to it. And Josh and I get up to our hotel room and he could tell that I was fuming over it. And he basically called me out on it. See, that's what I call accountability. And he helped me get my attitude back in check. But if you don't have trust, you don't have people who are willing to hold each other to account. And if you don't have accountability, then you start having inattention to results. Instead of looking at team results or organization results, we start looking at individual results. We start thinking, well, I'm going to go get mine. I'm just going to do what's right for me or for my team that I supervise and lead. And I don't care what happens to anyone else. So I just want you to understand why trust is the foundation to everything we do. I have used this quote. Uh, I bet for more than 20 years, I love this quote, and I think it's so true by Mahatma Gandhi, who says the moment there's suspicion about a person's motives, everything he and I inserted she because it's all of us, everything that individual does becomes tainted. We begin to look at them with a little bit of suspicion. Why are they doing that? See, trust no longer exists in that situation. So you need to be somebody that other people can trust. If I was with you in the room, I would ask you to participate with me in the small group exercise. And just because we're virtual, I'm still asking. But you're going to have to record it on your end 
on that sheet of paper that I hope you have in front of you, that notepad, or if you've got a cell phone that you can take notes in, I want you to do so. Here's a couple questions. What makes trust so vital to leadership in your opinion? Take a few seconds and, and jot a few things down. You heard me just give examples. You saw the model that Patrick Lencioni has out there where he talks about trust being the foundational level that if you don't have it, it can affect a lot of other things. But now I'm asking each and every one of you, what makes it so vital to leadership in your opinion? And the second part of that question is, and this is really important, if your trust is violated, is there anything the violator can do to ever get that trust back? Can they earn it back from you? And when I'm in the room with a group of people, I literally ask that question, not rhetorically. I ask it because I'm looking for people to give a response. And here's the responses. I get probably two thirds of the room say, nope, once my trust has been violated, you will never get it back. And then another third that says, yes, I, I think so, but it may not ever get back to the state where it originally was. They can earn it back. It's going to take a long time, but it'll never be what it initially was before they violated the trust. And so then I'd love to ask you, ask those in the room with me, there's varying levels of trust. Would you agree or disagree? Doesn't it matter what's being asked? See, if you or I were in the room together, even if we just met, if you were to say, Jay, I've got an emergency and I don't have a way to get home. Can I borrow your car? If it was a true emergency, I would hand you my keys. No questions asked. But then I love to say this. Would it matter what I drove, what my personal conveyance was? If I had a Lamborghini in the parking lot, something that cost six figures, would I give the keys as willingly as I might hand over the keys if what I drove was something 20 years old and, you know, seen its better days and nothing fancy? It matters, doesn't it? What if I needed somebody to watch my home when I went on vacation? Does that require a different level of trust? I think it does, right? Because I'm just not going to have anyone entering my home when I'm not there unless I truly trust them. What if I needed, this is the ultimate level of trust for me. What if I needed someone to go pick my daughter up from school? Does that require a different level of trust? I promise yes. you, you're reaching the upper threshold now for that. So I created this model. I call it tough tap, T-U-F versus T-A-P. And I'm going to explain. Let me ask you, are you the kind of person who can trust somebody up front without anything else? You just, they need something and you just trust them. See, that's tough to do. T-U-F, trust up front. Or are you the kind of person that somebody needs to prove themselves to you before you're willing to give them your trust? I call that TAP, trust after proof. And here's what the model looks like. If you're willing to trust up front, you give everything up front to them. And the only way that it decreases is if they do something that causes you to begin to question their trust. And then you start to withhold it. But the other part of it then is those of you that said, no, Jay, I'm willing to trust up front. So you withhold, you give very little up front. And then as they prove themselves worthy over time, you're willing to increase the amount that you give them. That's my model. That's what I use when I'm out talking to organizations. And I think most people can relate to that. But again, it matters. That's why I shared with you. It depends on what it is we're doing, what we're being asked to do, or what we're asking other people to do. Because there are times in our life when every single one of us trust up front. Yes, even those of you that said, no, no, I only trust after proof. Here's my proof to you that there are times you trust up front. Have you ever flown on an airplane? If you have, then you gave a whole lot of trust to somebody you don't know. You gave a lot of trust to the person, the man or woman in the cockpit that's flying that plane. So there are times that we put our trust up front and we're looking for and hoping for the best. 
Here's some quick ways to build trust, everybody. Number one, do what you say you're going to do and do it when you say you're going to do it. To me, if I can count on you because you're responsible and you always do what you say you're going to do, then you're going to be able to retain and earn a lot of trust from me. Foster an environment of accountability, right? Make sure that that people understand how important it is to be accountable for the things that they're individually responsible for. I, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I've worked in organizations where somebody did something wrong. Oftentimes we even know who the individuals are that did something wrong, but the leader of the organization calls everybody together, not just the few. They call everyone together and they criticize and chastise the entire group for the sins of a few. Look, if you want to earn trust, praise in public, correct in private, and don't correct all if all weren't responsible for the mistake. And then last but not, well, two things. One, be competent. I think that's really important. You want me to trust you? Show me you're competent in what you do. And then the, the last one is serve. I'll trust you if I see you're willing to roll your sleeves up and jump in and do the things that I'm doing. And I assure you, those that I lead, I never ask them to do something I'm not willing to do myself. And that's a great way to earn trust. Look, I, I think we can go to classes and take different courses and read books and and listen to different things. And if we just absorb the knowledge, that's great. It's excellent to have knowledge. But we need to apply it. Applied knowledge is really where the power is. So I'm asking you, what are you going to be willing to do in that short little presentation where I was talking about trust? What are you going to be willing to do to help build trust with those that you work with or for, as well as those you are charged to lead? People do what people see. So I'm going to encourage you to model what you're asking others to do. If you want them to trust you, start by trusting them and give them opportunities where they can see and feel the trust you've placed in them. Let's talk about some servant leadership. I love leadership in action. You know, several of us on this call have a common mentor, John C. Maxwell, and he's widely regarded as the world's number one leadership guru. And John didn't give himself that title. That's a title other people gave him. But see, John models exactly what he preaches. I once heard somebody at a conference I was at say, make no mistake about it. I'm smoking exactly what I'm selling. <laughs> now that creates a little bit of a lighthearted moment and a chuckle, but I often say that to people when I'm out in the room. See, I think a servant leader leads from the front and demonstrates that, that they're there for others. And I want people to see me doing exactly what it is I'm espousing, exactly what it is I'm recommending they do. I don't want to live separate from that. I don't want it to be a situation of do what I do and, and not as I or do what I say and not as I do. Right. I think that's a huge distinction. A little bit of reflection right here. Have you ever worked for somebody that you consider a servant leader? Don't stop at just a yes, no response. If you have worked for someone you considered a servant leader, I want you to think about them, picture them. Take yourself back to being in the room with them. Take yourself back to whatever activity it was you were doing with them. That's going to come into play here in a little bit. Here's a big barrier, everybody, to servant leadership. Maybe this is just as human beings that this happens. But I know this was true for me in the beginning. And I had the pleasure to everybody before I answer it for you. I had the pleasure of being on faculty as an uh, associate professor at a public university in the uh, southeastern part of the United States. And, and I was teaching young men and women leadership. And I was often talking about servant leadership then. But I'm amazed whether it's a young person or somebody a little mature in their life journey. When I talk about being a servant leader, those that have pushed back or said that they they didn't believe in servant leadership. It's because they falsely believe that servant leadership means subservient. It means that in some way, shape or form, 
you can't be the leader if you're serving others. And I'm just going to tell you right now, it's so not true. I think that's exactly the primary responsibility of as a leader. You know, I've heard again, my friend and mentor, John Maxwell, say that the last thing you want to have is destination disease. And he talks about that as being when somebody arrives in a certain position or a place in an organization like the top and they go, it's your job now to serve me. It's just simply not true. You haven't arrived. As you go up in responsibility and assume more leadership, you have a greater responsibility to serve others. I believe it. I know it to be true. And the organizations that I've been in that have achieved the biggest uh, successes, achieved the greatest results, servant leadership's been right at the heart of it. And it wasn't demonstrated by one person. Everyone embodied it. Let me give you a quick story. I've been using this since the early 2000s when I was teaching at that university. Some of you are maybe familiar with the movie Braveheart. Maybe some of you haven't seen it. But in the movie, uh, there's a king here uh, represented as the actor who portrayed the king in the movie Braveheart. This is Longshanks. He was very ruthless. He was a tyrant. And there is a scene in the movie where this huge battle is waging down below. He's kind of up on a hillside and down in this battle, hand to hand fighting with swords and fists and uh, axes. It's brutal. At one point, while he's in the place of safety, watching this battle take place, he turns to one of his military commanders and he says, release the arches. And this military commander was stupefied. He was like, but sire, won't we hit our own men? And the king says, yes, but we'll hit theirs too. See, to him, people were just a resource, a pawn for his ultimate gain. He didn't care about them. But if we were to contrast that with the person the movie was really framed around, which was Braveheart, William Wallace, you know, somebody who really did live in real life and championed was a champion for Scot uh, Scotland's independence from England. In that same battle scene, it portrayed William Wallace not being in a place of safety and far removed. He was right in the middle of it, right in the middle of all that brutality and gore. He believed in the cause so greatly that he wasn't saying you all go do on my behalf. He led them into it. To me, that's what servant leadership looks like. Here's another question I want you to ponder. If you reflect back on that person or persons, if you answered yes earlier when I said, have you ever worked for or been around somebody you considered a servant leader? What are some of the attributes they possess that make you label them that way? See, I really do believe success leaves footprints. I really do believe we can look at someone and say, wow, that's a really fantastic quality they have. I want to be more like that. But first, we have to recognize it. We have to be aware of it. And if we can see that character, or that attribute, that trait, and begin to implement it into our own lives, then we can become that. Now, there is a danger, everybody, right? You understand there's two sides to everything. It's called the law of polarity. You don't have up without down. You don't have right without left. If we're not careful, we can take on attributes of others who are not good for us. So whoever it was that you thought of when I asked you to reflect earlier about a servant leader, what were the good qualities? Which ones do you currently possess? And if you don't possess them, let's identify them and let's talk about what you can start doing to begin developing that habit in your own life. Harvey Firestone is uh, someone who I, I really love, you know, reading his story. One of the early icons here in uh, the United States, American culture. And he said, the growth and development of people is the highest calling of a leader. If you want to be a servant leader, you know, I go back to the quote by Zig Ziglar. 
you really do need to take the time to invest in others and, and help them grow. And it looks like I've got maybe just a couple more minutes. So I'm going to move us through these a little bit quickly, and then I'm going to look forward to maybe having a few questions and some interaction time with you. This is a chart that I created back in 2018, and I use this when I'm out in an organization training others. You know, one column says self-serving leader, and the other column says servant leader. See, a self-servant leader will look at someone and say, I'm smarter than they are. But a servant leader will say, we can learn from one another. A self-serving leader will say, do as I say, not as I do. But a servant leader says, I'm going to lead by example. A self-serving leader says it's my way or the highway, but a servant leader is willing to ask, what are your thoughts on this? Self-serving leader, that's your job, not mine. A servant leader, come on, let's do this together. Self-serving, it's not your, or, or he'll, they'll say he or she, it is your fault that you failed or that this failed, but a servant leader will say, I'm responsible. Now, what can we do to improve? A self-serving, look at what I've accomplished. A servant leader, look at what we've accomplished. Self-serving, what can they do for me? A servant leader, how can I serve and assist them? Self-serving, I wish they would fix it. A servant leader, how can I coach them through it? A self-serving leader, I'm not interested in your personal life, but a servant leader recognizes our lives are intertwined. They value and they actually want to know more about you. I mean, how would you ever know if one of your people is not doing well unless you knew more about them? And you've got to do it from a place of genuine interest and sincerity. Get to know them so that when you ask how you're doing, you actually know. You can tell when they're not feeling themselves. And then the last one, a self-serving leader looks at people and thinks you're simply a stepping stone to what I want. But a servant leader genuinely wants to see you succeed and achieve your goals. And I think that's important. Here's a quote that I use with leaders. This is my own. I really do believe servant leadership starts at the top with the leader and it involves, involves rolling up the sleeves. You need to be willing to get dirty. You need to be willing to put some sweat equity into it and you need to be willing to do the things you're asking other people to do. That doesn't mean you're always going to do it. It just means you need to be willing to. And from time to time, they ought to see you doing it. Here's some key responsibilities that I think all leaders hold. They put others before themselves. They don't get hung up on rank or position. Look, I'm a retired military guy, so I've come out of an environment where rank was really important. Even then, I never led by using my rank. I believe anyone who ever worked for me in my 22 year career in the Air Force, I believe that if you were to get them one on one and ask them, they would never say I had to lead from my rank or position. I believe a servant leader possesses confidence to serve because we're not worried about what someone thinks of us going out onto the production floor and getting on our knees and helping clean up at the end of the day to make things look good for the next day. I also think a servant leader serves from a place of love, and I think a servant leader empowers employees. Back to my friend and mentor, John Maxwell, I heard him say this once, and I, I absolutely uh, grabbed a hold of it, and I think about it often. You can love people and not lead them, but you can't lead them and not love them. Your people need to know you care about them, and I hope that that's the kind of person you are. I heard a uh, speaker last year by the name of Chris Hogan. He's with Ramsey's Financial Solutions. I'm just letting you know this is where I came, where I got these questions. Uh, Chris delivered one of the best talks I've ever heard on servant leadership. And he said as leaders, as a servant leader, at least a couple times a week, you should be asking these questions of those that work for you. And in fact, he would say not work for you, but work with you. Right. Because he says you don't own anybody. So. So when you think work for you, that's not the best way of viewing them. You work with one another. But he says these three questions are key to servant leadership. Go ask someone how they're doing and don't do it and get an OK or fine and not be attuned to whether or not they're really OK or fine, because that's how a lot of people respond. And maybe that's not really how they feel. And then be genuinely interested in what they're working on. And when I brought this up to a healthcare organization I was just working with, uh, about a month ago, and I'm still with their executive leadership team. 
one of their leaders in the room said, Jay, I'm never going to go ask my team what they're working on. And I was like, really? Why not? And he said, because they're going to be worried that how they respond is going to dictate whether I put more tasks on their plate. And I said, well, then you need to make sure you clarify why you're asking. You do it because you're genuinely interested and you reinforce it by the next. Are we having uh, internet difficulty? Yeah, I think Jay is stuck. Okay, while well, he is coming back uh, in the meantime, uh, since uh, we get a few seconds, I know we're going to open up the uh, session for uh, questions and discussion. I did not see any questions coming live into Facebook or YouTube yet, uh, but just a couple of things that I wanted to mention that in 2021, uh, we will resume our sessions again on the second uh, week uh, week of uh, January, the 9th of January, with uh, Glenn Hodges. I think he got dropped off. He'll probably uh, come back in. So let's wait for them. In the meantime, uh, Raj, uh, did you have a uh, run? Did you have any, any anything to add to what uh, John uh, Jay was uh, uh, concluding on, or while I? text him okay do that okay jay you're on yeah it looks like i had just a temporary internet loss there so look i'm wrapping up everybody but here here's what i would ask you to commit and apply in your own life what are you willing to commit to to begin becoming a servant leader that other people look up to and want to model their own life after it doesn't have to be huge gains right out of the gate be willing to do small things Small things over time will yield big impact and results. And I end you with this. For those of you that are willing to serve and go the extra mile, you want to know why the extra mile makes such a big difference? Because most people don't even go the first mile. You have the opportunity to be a servant leader and change the dynamics of the organizations, the teams, and the relationships that you operate in. I thank each and every one of you for giving me the opportunity to share with you today. I hope there were some things I, I shared that were meaningful to you. And now I turn to my friends uh, who are the leadership team of the Young Titans and just ask, what questions do you have for me? How can I assist you? Yeah, Jay, when you dropped off, I was just adding, I was just saying that, you know, a few couple of the announcements, few things about YTP before I open it for discussion or question session. We did not get any questions, live questions, even though I got some uh, thank you notes and how can I join that kind of message uh, on for your training. So I'm sure there are people uh, that are around the world actually um, you know, watching and they will be watching. Uh, but just for the uh, viewers and uh, especially for the young titans, young professionals, just to let you know that we are going to open our second phase of YTP in 2021. And our next uh, speaker is actually uh, Glenn Hodges, uh, second week of January. Um, uh, Glenn is right here with us uh, today. And um, of course, uh, we're going to uh, open up a few more courses and a few other things at the same time. Facebook private uh, page where we're going to reveal some more information to help you guys and keep it a content or, or a, a private group so that way we can ask ourselves or we can get help from each other. But with that, let us get started with some questions and answers. Uh, Ron, Raj, uh, please uh, yeah, take over or uh, lead. Uh, I know uh, my heart is full. I know Jay uh, from his hair to be a little less uh, gray, I think. Or, or, uh, I had a little bit more dense hair. But regardless, you know, friendship and trust what he said you know i i learned from some of the things from my own experience with association with jay and a couple of the things that you mentioned of course those are very important uh, vacation uh, taking the, uh, vacation I, I took some notes you know who you go with uh, who is the trusted people that you go with vacation and a few others you know so those are those are very very important things. but anyway the floor is open please go ahead can i ask question hi jay yeah, the word leadership always attracted me since I have grown up. I have seen myself, you know, I was 
first of the five children of my parents. And then when I moved on to my career, I could see something in me and that would take me forward. You know, uh, my question to you that why did you choose the word servant? Um, is that something um, attractive to people or how does it attract people or translate people? That word is sometimes is kind of in, in our part of the world, like you are servant and something like that. Yeah. So what, what made you think, use that word servant? Yeah, Dr. Halita, that's a great question. And, you know, the term was actually coined by Robert Greenleaf in the 70s, in the 1970s. Uh, the reason that I've always really embraced it is because uh, maybe like many of you, I've worked for leaders who... Uh, Oh, I don't know. They ruled with an iron fist is what I would say. You know, they were constantly yelling and shouting and telling. And uh, and I don't think that that's the best way to, to get the most out of people. So the word servant to me, Dr. Halita, you know, I shared early on I, that one of the barriers I feel, because I think what you're asking is, is very fair. And there are cultural differences around the world. You're right is that people hear it and they think subservient, like you're giving away all of uh, your uh, personal worth to help somebody. But I don't view that that way, Dr. Halita. I really believe our worth is increased when we're serving others. And I think, you know, earlier I used the quote by uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, I, he was a person who self-sacrificed on behalf of others. And I think it's that sacrificial piece of leadership that we can look at and say, that's truly servitude, to give up your own wants and desires to help someone else. So that's what attracted me, Dr. Halita, and what I've tried to live out in my life. Uh, I really think, I really wish more people would embrace that notion. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, that's what I thought, yeah, anyway. Yeah, you're welcome. Great, great Go ahead. That's a great question. I appreciated that. Jay, do you have objective measures to help organizations uh, measure, uh, I say objective metrics to help organizations measure trust, respect, confidence? Very briefly, I too come from 22 years of Air Force experience. I am amongst the fighter pilot community where in some instances, big, bold, burly, I'm in charge here. All you have to do is listen to me is yeah. the mantra. Yeah, no, I, I do. You know, I've got my own effectiveness uh, exercise that I carry in and I ask their, uh, their team members to willingly fill it out. I don't even want names on them if you want the truth. I take it back and I compile those results to kind of give the organizational leadership and idea of maybe where there's areas to work inside the organization to make gains. And if we can measure, Ron, I know you know this already, if we can measure where they are at a beginning point and then over time through repetition, uh, equipping them and having them actually put it into application, come back at a later time and measure it and, and uh, bounce that against the initial review that we did, I think you can start to see where there's some shifts in it. But trust is a very delicate thing. And, uh, and it varies so greatly from person to person. But I am working with a nonprofit organization right now that had zero trust. And I've been working with them for four months. And I will tell you that what is starting to be seen and felt inside that organization now is truly a group of individuals who are willing uh, to let any one of the other members take point, lead, uh, take responsibility for something because they, they truly are starting to recognize that there is trust there and that together they can accomplish way more than doing something alone. No, that's well said, Jay. I will close out by asking you, do you see trust being largely personality dependent? Uh, those who are DISC certified, those of us who are high D task oriented, my observation is, and I just want to compare it with yours, we who are task oriented will frequently assign a 10 uh, on a 10 point scale of, of trust right up front. 
We're a trust up front, the tough, to use your analogy. Whereas those who are on the people-oriented side frequently say, well, I, I need to see trust in action or it's a trust after proof type thing. Do you have that uh, type observation? I do, Ron, but not to, not to go against what you've said at all. Uh, I am dissertified. My undergraduate degree is from college is heavily rooted in behavior analysis. I actually have the different perspective. I actually feel like those that are task oriented are the ones that generally withhold it until proof is given. And those of us that are very, I'm a high eye, Ron. Those of us that are very people oriented tend to be a little more, oh, we'll just, you know, they're, they're not gonna do anything to us or they don't have any nefarious reasons for doing something. Again, I believe that that could fall either way Ron, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of my perspective on it. I, I, if, if you know Dr. Uh, Ron, Rome, like I do, uh, that's who I initially got my certification through. I love to use this analogy. You know, he, he would talk about um, people who are task oriented. They need to trust you before they like you. And people who are people oriented need to like you before they trust you. And I like the example of a snake. When I'm in the room, I love to ask people, have you ever held a snake? And people's head nods. And I'm like, they're slimy, right? And people will nod their head. I'm like, you've never held a snake if you think they're slimy, right? They're really dry and coarse. But if you were to rub the snake from the neck down to the tail, it's smooth. And then I love to look at the group and say, what happens if you rub the snake from the tail to the head? And they're all looking at me and I'm like, the snake gets pissed off, right? Forgive the terminology, the snake is mad. Because it, it, it goes counter to their uh, scales. It's very uncomfortable, the snake. And I think, Ron, that's how we are as human beings. That, yeah, personality, we see the world through how we're hardwired, Ron. So I absolutely agree it starts there for sure. Thank you, Jay. Great insights. Thanks, sir. Appreciate you. And thank you for your service, Ron. I do know that. I remember you and I talking before. And always good to be in the space with a fellow Air Force brother. Jay, you you were yeah, talking right back to you, about Jay. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Jay, and talking you. about snakes, uh, I think there's some parts of the country they have rattlesnake roundups every year. Have you yeah, participated in one? <laughs> they do that where I live. <laughs> I, I thought it was the state of Texas. Yeah, Texas and Oklahoma. I grew up in Oklahoma, but yeah. You know, I, I was I was one thing struck my mind while you were talking and you were talking about great leaders that we all respect. Uh, you know, one of my mentors is John Maxwell, uh, like yours. And and then Don Green, the executive director of the Napoleon Hill Foundation, the man mm -hmm. that knows Napoleon Hill better than Napoleon Hill knew himself. <laughs> A very dear friend. And he's introduced me to so many people. But I, I got to thinking that there's so many others that have influenced my life, but there are other leaders that aren't recognized that have had an influence on my life. I can remember any of you ever that frequently flew the friendly skies can remember the days of Eastern Airlines and Frank Borman and, and their famous grease pocket chicken. When you cut into it, it would spew all over your tie. Well, the Atlanta airport, if you'll remember the old Atlanta airport was, it was, a, was round. And then you had the spokes going out from it from the different, uh, uh, gates, et cetera. But one of my highlights always and there was to go in the men's room and there was, there was a man there that, that had towels. He didn't charge for them. He was on his own. He had them laundered himself. He had every kind of aftershave you could think of there. And I, I discovered after years of doing it that I wasn't the only one that looked forward to going by and seeing him. He always had something kind to say. And of course we would tip him. He worked solely for tips, but as such, he was really a servant leader in another way. You don't have to necessarily lead large, small or large numbers of people to be a leader. I, uh, I think about a, a fellow that when I was in high school in the summers, I would ride to a cabinet factory with 
where I was the putty boy. I, it was a big commercial cabinet company. I say big, it was for a country boy. It was big. There were probably only 75 employees there, but I was, came from a farm. I'd never been in a factory and I would, I would put putty over the, the nail holes and screw holes, et cetera. On, and, and then they would go on to the next stage where people would sand. But Mr. Sam, I always look forward in the mornings, riding with him and riding home with him. He always, he talked very slowly, but he was just full of wisdom. So what, what do you think about that? Do you think that those are also servant leaders? Yeah, Glenn, I'm in, you know, complete agreement. It's, um, it has nothing to do with numbers. You're exactly right. I mean, we lead right from where we're at. And I, you know, Glenn, I talked to so many young people who, when I ask, uh, are you a leader? They respond with, well, I don't supervise anybody. Well, that's got nothing to do with it. Right. I love to say, if you've got people who routinely come to you for advice, for help, for assistance in whatever part of your life, you're a leader to them. Right. Our mentor, Glenn, as you talked about, John, he talks about leadership as influence, nothing more, nothing less. So where we take the time to help others in any way or regarding create influence, we're leaders. So, I mean, yeah, I'm in complete agreement that it can be in small group settings. But, we, you know, it begins with leading ourselves, too. I think that every one of you on this screen would agree with that. There's a lot of people who don't even lead themselves well. They don't even do the things that they say are important. And, and so uh, if you can't lead yourself, how in the world are you ever going to help someone else be effective? And, and you know, the thing that is fright was frightening to me after I finally realized it is that regardless of what your position is, people are looking at you that you don't even know are looking at what you're doing how you're responding, what you're saying. Uh, I had a, a young man that sometimes jumps on my mastermind call. He's actually in, um, in Portugal. And I met him at a, uh, an event, not anything to do with leadership or John Maxwell, uh, about six or seven years ago. And, uh, one day after I'd kind of closed out the session. He stayed on and we got to talking. He says, Glenn said there was something about you. And I just, you might not have realized it, but at that event in Denver, I followed you around. I said, you did. He said, yes, I, I liked the way you engaged with people and you love to interview people and you kept your camcorder with you and you would recruit someone to hold the camera and said, you might not remember, but I actually held the camera for you once. And so that really woke me up because oftentimes, Oh, you know, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm out of town, <laughs> but whether you're in town, out of town, there are people you don't know that are watching you. Okay. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, you know, we're always on, uh, we're always on display, Glenn. I, I was thinking back to Chris Hogan. Uh, again, he's with Ramsey's uh, Financial Solutions. And he said, you know, you all are listening to me today. And I'm up here on stage talking about servant leadership. But this is what he said next, Glenn. He said, but when you're back in your organization, you're the one on stage. So, Glenn, I, you know, I take from that meaning there are always other people watching us. You're exactly right. Uh, I'm so mindful in my own home. You know, I just came out of the toughest season in my life. Uh, I, I won't get into what it was, but some really significant things in my personal life. And there are so many people that now I'm on the back end of this challenge and I'm talking about it a little more freely. And they're like, Jay, I had no idea. And I'm like, well, that's because I wasn't going to go out into the world and, and be anything other than who I am, right? Which is a very positive, upbeat person. But I'm so mindful that I've got a 14-year-old daughter who I constantly think about. If I say to her, do this or don't do that, and then two minutes later, she turns around and sees me doing the opposite, what is she going to do? She's going to do what she sees me doing way more than what I 
have conversation with her around because that's what people do. Pe people do what people see. So you're right, Glenn. We're always modeling it for other people, and we need to be cognizant of that. Yeah, you know, something else that is part of leadership, like you said, another way of putting that is uh, there are those that talk the talk and those that walk the walk. But with you mentioning uh, opportunities that you've had in your own personal life and show me the man or lady that's part of this program, regardless of the age, that hasn't had something really almost devastating going on in their lives at times when, you know, they just couldn't share it from the stage. Yeah. But yet, in just you saying that, everyone connected even more with you. It's authenticity. It's transparency. And I say authenticity is the great connector. It, 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 it attracts people just like a magnet attracts steel. Thank you so much, Jay. This has been Thanks. so valuable. Thanks, Glenn, for your kind words. Good, good getting to interact with you and all the others. I think that was just amazing session. I mean, if uh, I would suggest anyone who is uh, right now on to share this and have people watch this uh, later on as a complete uh, segment. And uh, uh, I would say people go back and rewatch it because there is so much in it that you would have missed, I'm telling you. Because there's so, it is like the information is so valuable, specifically for young titans. What happens is that at this juncture, there might be many things which you don't understand on leadership. And one of the aspects is that, Jay, you're 100% right. Uh, many times when I'm working at this level with young people, their answer is nobody's reporting to me. No, I'm not a leader. And I look at it and I said, yes, I was like that too. Okay. At one time. But now that we are putting this out there and you have so aptly said what leadership is and how people need to understand leadership. This is all I want to tell to all the young titans is this is what exactly we are bringing to you. What has taken us years to understand, discover? You are getting it now at the start of your career. If you are able to learn from this and implement even 10%, just 10%, your life would be very different. I know what Jay said with struggles. I have had struggles with my life. I learned the hard way on so many things. By the time I discovered things, it's not easy. And But now when I think back, if I would have had that knowledge then, could my life had been different? My answer is yes. So that is exactly what we are bringing to you. And your session today, Jay, was just, I would say, amazing. And it is a learning lesson, not just saying, oh, wow, Jay said so well. It's so good. No. Go into the depth of it and try to understand the meaning of it. And it will, just this one session, if you go into it, will change your life. So thank you. Wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. It's an, it's an honor. And I really appreciate you all and what you're doing and for allowing me just to come share a little bit today. Love, love and respect each and every one of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We enjoyed it totally. Yes. Thank you. Well, Raj, I, I just happen to think of one thing for the young Titans is the fact that sometimes maybe they're reluctant to reach out and ask for help. Uh, I can say truly from the bottom of my heart, and I often say it, uh, that to help another person and them show gratitude for it, and you see the results of the time you spent with them, there's not a dollar that can be attached to that as far as the value. So every time I help someone, I grow. I grow. Sure. And so Titans, don't, don't be reluctant to reach out. If you think that there's someone here that can help you, uh, we're all servant leaders. And thank you for this powerful lesson today, Jay. Thanks. So Jay, we are at the end of our 75 minute session. All I can just say, it was a uh, heart full of information and it's really uh, hit home for me too. 
And some of the things I actually heard, known, or read, or even taught some things. But the way you explain the things that you said, that is invaluable. And just like Rod said, uh, if you go through that and take some notes for yourself and learn and apply that, you'll get ahead. And uh, Ron and Glenn, thank you so much for the things that you have done. And Dr. Halida, thanks for your presence only. I mean, on top of that, what you do for us, you know, that's uh, absolutely honorable thing for us to have. So, uh, but anyway, with that, all I wanted to say that happy holidays to all of you, whoever watching, because this is end of uh, uh, December. Uh, 2020, which is an unbelievable and amazing year that in 100 years we did not have a year like this. But within that, the way we grew and the way we bonded, even with the social distancing, I think that actually deserves a talk and discussion and all those. So we'll do that in some other time. And there are lots of questions, lots of things that I can ask now, but we'll hold off to that for 2021. And in 2021, our first speaker is Glenn Hodges, who is right here, honorable speaker. Thank you for that. And at the same time, we will have our second phase and a few other things coming on. So those announcements and everything will go out. But once one more time, thank you and uh, happy holidays, happy new year, and take care of yourself and have a great weekend this weekend. Thank bye you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye now. Merry Christmas, everybody. Great session. Yeah.